All right. Good afternoon, everyone out there. Good morning, uh, depending on where uh, where you're, you're meeting us from. Sorry, my phone's ringing here. Turn that off. Uh, Dave Broadbent, ABYC's Education Director, and the uh, other guy on the screen here is Tyler Car Caraway with Yamaha. So he's going to be doing a great presentation for us on propeller selection. Uh, Got to go through a couple of my intro slides as always here. Uh, we want to thank our sponsors. You know, it's been a this has been a what, this is our 15th, I think, now. And, uh, you know, we have some great sponsors here between DAPSCO, Rural Xylem, uh, Safe Harbor Marine, Vetus Maxwell, as well as SAM. So thanks, thanks for our sponsors for these webinars, uh, helping us keep these things going and bringing the uh, relevant information to everyone out there. Uh, a couple updates on our side, not much has changed. You know, we still have our standards week coming up in January. Uh, we have our annual meeting, which could be January 5th. Our PTC meetings are running all January from the 11th to the 21st. Um, our SureTech event, which is a surveyor technician event, is going to be January 6th and 7th. Um, and we do have a standard certification course in conjunction with this. So mark your calendar for these dates. Uh, take a look at some of them. If you have any questions on that, just let us know. Webinars are going to continue also. So uh, as always, to go to members first and, uh, and then to the general public. Uh, here is our some information on our online classes. So we are scheduled out through April. We did add a fast track for December for electrical. So if you're interested uh, in taking that and you have some experience, uh, feel free to jump on that one. Uh, the rest of our courses you can view at abycinc.org slash schedule. Um, they're great. We've been doing, uh, we've had a ton of them now. Uh, we've certified a ton of technicians. Our passing rate has gone up. So if you've ever been thinking about getting certified, uh, go ahead and take a look at that calendar. CEUs, as always for these webinars, you do earn CEUs for these. Uh, so if you are watching this live, uh, tomorrow, you'll get a follow-up email with a link to apply for those CEUs. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, there will be a link that pops up at the end of the video for you to apply for those CEUs. Um, as always, also with questions, any questions you have, there's a little question box you have, uh, type in there, uh, whatever you got, and at the end of the presentation, I'll read them off to Tyler, and we'll get to as many as we can for you. Uh, the next webinar is going to be November, November 9th, and that's on some boat fire stuff. So. Uh, take a look at that. If you're interested, mark your calendar. Uh, the, the registration will go out the week of like it always does. Um, and then we're getting to the end of our fall season here. So we have uh, November 19th, December 10th, and January 28th will kind of be the end of our webinar series for, uh, for the fall. We'll be starting up another one in the spring there. And with that, I'll introduce you to Tyler Carraway here, and he'll be able to give a little better intro of himself here, and uh, we'll get rolling. So let me... Uh, Turn over control to you, Tyler, and we will get going. Thanks, David. Uh, my name's Tyler Careway. I have, oh, let me see if my, is my screen showing for you? Let's see. Yep, I see, uh, I see your first slide there. Can you see me? Yeah, okay. Again. Alrighty guys, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Tyler Caraway. I'm an instructor for Yamaha, <clears throat> Yamaha Motor Corporation. I've been with Yamaha for about three years. Um, do you know daily uh, daily courses here? I teach the two week course for the service skills and training course. It's more of a basic beginner course that you will come into if you're you know straight from a technical school or maybe uh, a guy out in the yard that's starting to work for the boat. For the, for the actual shop, um, learning to get a little technical. So today I'm gonna be presenting a propeller selection. It's gonna be more of just basic characteristics of how to find the proper propeller for your boat, um, whether it be changing applications, uh, the number of blades, we'll talk about the materials, um, and we'll also get into a little bit about using performance bulletins when it comes to repowering. So I am going to go ahead and turn my camera off and we will get started here. Let's see. All righty, so propeller selection. Um, when it comes to uh, owning a boat, one of the first questions that you get as a technician or you know, being working at a dealership would be, what propeller do I need for my boat? Um, many people don't realize that all outboard engines do not come with a propeller. There is not a designated propeller for this designated horsepower of boat. Um, the only outboards that are really truly gonna come with propellers are gonna be our really small uh, portable models, 
once you get up into mid-range inline and v engine it's it starts turning into what application do you have um, what are you trying to accomplish uh, what performance characteristics do you enjoy and you know what's your main goal of being out there on the water um, so moving forward uh, one of the main things here is going to be you know the propeller itself um, the propeller some people would say it's probably the hardest working single piece of equipment on the boat um, it has to transfer all the horsepower that your motor is making and turn it into thrust and put it out of the back of the put it out of the back of the boat to move that boat forward so there's a couple key things that you need to understand about a propeller um, and knowing the the accomplishment that the propeller is actually trying to make and the characteristics that affect this will help you understand why or why not your boat is performing the way you want it to or not um, along with how to you know best fit the application that you're working for so uh, what is a propeller trying to accomplish multiple things so one of those would be top speed um, you'll see the picture up here uh, of the bass boat. We have, you know, a lot of guys out there uh, tournament fishing. Um, if you've ever been to a bass tournament or ever been involved in one, you'll notice the shotgun start. We're waiting for a horn and boom, we're off to the races and everybody's racing for that first fishing hole, trying to put as much fish in the boat as possible. Um, so typically bass boat guys, uh, uh, high engine mounting heights, jack plates, things like that, they're looking more for top speed. Um, when you start getting into water sports, such as the picture on the top right of the screen, um, it's more about hole shot and acceleration. If you have a wakeboarder or a water skier uh, hooked up to a rope on the back, you want to be able to get that boat up and out of the water and on plane as soon as you can to get your skier or wakeboarder out of the water. Um, with that being said, they're not too concerned about the top speed because it would be dangerous to be pulling somebody on a ski at 60, 70 miles an hour. It's more about just the fun and the laughs and the time spent with each other. Um, then you'll notice the picture on the bottom here. We got a, a boat heading out offshore. Um, a, an accomplishment that this boat would most likely be trying to achieve would be lift, uh, whether it be on the bow or the stern. Typically, boats with a deeper hull, a deeper v hole, bigger offshore boats, um, they're going to need a little bit more bow lift or stern lift to be able to get that boat up and out of the water to be able to perform, whether it be in glassy waters or big rolling waves. We want to keep that bow up to make sure that we have a dry ride for everybody else. Um, next, we have load carrying abilities. So this might be for the commercial side of boating where we're using this boat as you know work. We're using it to work, whether it be pushing a barge around, um, loading it up with you know uh, construction equipment, working on bridges, underwater pilings, um, things to that nature. You know you may need more of all we need to do is move the boat forward. We just need to get from A to B. We don't need to worry about top speeds, uh, hole shot, or truly handling, we just need to make sure that we can push water behind us to where we can get to where we need to be. Uh, last but definitely not least, we got handling characteristics and the ability for turning, high speed turns and things like that. Uh, there are a lot of people out there that do recreational boat racing um, at, on top of simply just cruising around at higher speeds. Uh, when it comes to being able to handle uh, the boat you don't want too much steering torque or too much steering slop uh, when it comes to turning you want to be able to you know sometimes make hard aggressive turns or more aggressive than usual and not have to worry about what we say or what we call the prop blowing out of the water um, which would mean you know begin to cavitate and maybe your rpm start to rev up you you lose a little bit of bite um, so these are the main uh, accomplishments that the, the propeller is trying to achieve. Now, to be able to achieve these accomplishments, there's multiple different characteristics about a propeller itself that they have to all add up to make this good formula that we want 
and it, to, to be able to achieve really what we want to do and the performance characteristics of our boat. So what propeller characteristics affect this accomplishment? Um, we'll go through about nine different characteristics uh, in, this, in this presentation. Um, if you have any experience in the field, one of the most common questions about the propeller and which propeller do I need uh, is going to be pitch. What pitch do I need for my, let's say, F-150 on my 21-foot bay boat? Um, pitch. Pitch, the definition of pitch would be the distance in inches a propeller would theoretically move after one revolution if it were traveling through a solid. Which means, let's say I have a 17 inch propeller, one full revolution of that propeller should move me 17 inches forward in the water. Now, when it comes to pitch, it has a direct correlation with RPMs your operating RPMs. Uh, when it comes to Yamaha, we prefer that these motors are turning 5,500 to 6,000 RPMs at the wide open throttle range, which means full throttle. <clears throat> when it comes to RPMs and pitch, the higher the pitch that you have, the lower you're actually going to see in RPMs. But with that being said, the higher the pitch means the longer the distance traveled after one revolution, which means higher top speeds. Typically, you're going to see a higher pitch prop on lighter boats um, that have maybe a high, a high mounting height, uh, a jack plate on it, um, less actually wetted surface of the boat in the water. So we don't have as much drag on the boat. But at the same time, more pitch on the propeller is going to give us more drag on that prop. When we go the opposite direction and we talk about lower pitch, that's going to give us more push. It's also going to give us a better hole shot because we don't have that drag and that strain from the twist of that propeller blade biting into that water. So it's able, it, it allows that prop to actually spin quicker and easier in the water than a higher pitch prop. Um, so with the lower pitch prop, now that it's easier to spin, we are now able to gain in our engine RPMs. At the same time, we have to consider the, the give and the take side of this. If we gain in our RPMs, we are going to lose a little bit of top speed. Um, so there definitely is a uh, a, a weighing of what do we want to do, and that kind of comes into play with what are we trying to do? What are we even trying to accomplish here? The next, uh, the next popular question about props is going to be, what diameter do I need? When it comes to diameter, this is the total width of the circle created by the blade tips as they spin. Um, so a larger diameter prop is going to have more surface of the prop on the water, which is going to give us a better hole shot. It will push more water. At the same time, it's also going to be able to reach deeper into the water, lowering our turning cavitation. Um, now, with this larger diameter, we are going to run into a little bit more drag on the propeller, which of course means more strain, which equals lower RPMs. Typically, larger, heavier boats, offshore boats, they are going to be using props with a very nice, uh, a very big, nice diameter of a prop. It reaches lower into the water. We can get a better hole shot. We can get this boat lifted up out of the water and on plane sooner. Now, the opposite is going smaller in diameter. Um, smaller diameter props are going to be found more on lighter boats. Um, they are going to create less drag because there is less wetted surface of that prop in the water, which means that we are going to gain in RPMs. Now, just like we talked about previously with pitch, diameter is going to have a direct correlation with RPMs. So just like pitch, we talked about um, going up in pitch, it's going to lower our RPMs. Going down in pitch is going to raise our RPMs. When it comes to diameter, going up in diameter is going to lower our RPMs, and going down in diameter is going to raise our RPMs. Um, when it comes to the size of diameter, typically 
a quarter inch is equal to about 150 plus or minus 50 RPMs. So let's say we go down a quarter inch in pitch, or sorry, a quarter inch in diameter of our prop, we could see a gain of anywhere from 100 to 200 RPMs. Going back to pitch, one inch of pitch is that same equivalent to 150 plus or minus 50 RPMs. So if we go up in pitch, we're going to lose anywhere from 100 to 200 RPMs. Moving on from pitch and diameter, we're gonna start talking about blade surface area. This is simply going to be the total surface area of the propeller blade in the water. Um, more blade surface means more pushing of water, which is going to give us a better hole shot. Um, it is also going to help with lift. So if we have a, a, a heavier uh, deep V boat that we need to actually get the bow lifted up or maybe even the stern lifted up, we may want to use a prop that's got a little bit more blade surface area. Now, with that being said, more blade surface area does equal to more drag. Um, like I said, you will find these on heavier boats where we're not too concerned about what is our top speed going to be. We're more concerned about simply the performance of the boat getting up out of the water and giving us a nice, comfortable, dry ride. Uh, when we go down in blade surface, when we have less blade surface, we start seeing higher RPMs because of that less amount of drag of that wetted surface of that propeller blade. Typically, small blade surface props you're going to find on the lighter boats as opposed to the heavier boats with those big, fat blades on the prop. Moving on from here, we're going to continue and go over to some more characteristics. Uh, the first one on this slide is going to talk about rake. Rake is the angle of the blades in degrees in relation to the propeller's barrel or the hub of the propeller, the center of the propeller. When it comes to rake, uh, if you have more rake, you're going to run into more lift. It's going to be more aggressive bite in the water, which is going to try to push that prop down in the water, which is going to create that front of that boat to lift up. Boats that have a higher mounting height, such as uh, bass boats, bay boats, little uh, tunnel hole boats for shallow water applications, they are typically going to have more rake as they can bite the water a little bit better, even if that motor is raised up a little bit higher. Um, the more rake that we do have, we're going to run into lowering of the RPMs because we are creating a little bit more strain with the amount of rake that we have on that propeller blade. The lower the degree of rake, you're gonna see a faster hole shot. Just like a lower pitch, it's easier for that propeller to spin in that water to get us to our hole shot. Uh, when I say hole shot, I mean from a standing still or a idle in gear to just on plane. That's gonna be our hole shot. So the less rake we have, the easier that prop is going to spin in the water, which means we're gonna have a faster hole shot, which ultimately we are also going to have higher RPMs. Um, more rake, lower RPMs, higher top speed, lower the rake, higher RPMs, a little bit less top speed. Then we move on to cup. Um, the cup is simply the small curved lip on the blade tip. I like to refer to cup as tread on a tire. Um, we talked about blade surface area and diameter. That would be more of a big wide tire on the road as opposed to a, a skinny tire. And then when I discuss cup, I look at it as the tread on the actual tire. Um, when it comes to the cup, the more cup that you have, the more grip that you're gonna have. So you can actually raise that motor up just a little bit more and it's still gonna bite that water and push that motor forward or that boat forward. Um, with that being said, more grip, you're gonna have less cavitation. Typically, you're gonna find these on lighter boats, um, bass boats, bay boats, tunnel hulls, just like with the with the more rake, we're gonna find this on, on lighter boats. It's easier 
for the prop to turn in the water uh, when we don't have such a load on the on the prop itself. So a lighter boat's going to help us out there. If we run into less cupping, we are going to have less drag, which that's going to go right back to less strain, less wetted surface. So we're going to see a faster hole shot. Um, prop boats that have that boats that are a whole lot heavier, deep V boats, they are typically going to have less cup because those motors are going to be typically lower into the water. So we're not going to really be dealing with jack plates and uh, and, and higher mounted applications. We're going to have a, a lower app, lower mounted application where the, the prop is fully into the water. The next one that we'll talk about is ventilation. Uh, when it comes to ventilation, um, ventilation is when air is drawn in around the propeller blades to allow for slip. So sometimes slip is a good thing. Um, when it comes to slip, a certain amount of, of slip is put into these props. You'll notice in this picture here, uh, the, the propeller on the top has a hole in it. The propeller on the bottom does not have a hole in it. Um, we make what we call plugs in these ventilated propellers that you can remove the plug to create more slip. Um, ventilated props typically are going to be on lighter boats, but more commonly they're going to be found on two-stroke applications where we are trying to reach that power band. Uh, when you talk about two-stroke engines, uh, there's not as much torque at the low end of the RPM range, so we have to get the RPMs built up to hit that power band to achieve that whole shot and that, that wide open throttle, that, that top speed that we wanna see. So ventilated props, more typically, you're gonna find those on two-stroke applications, but that is not to say that you're never going to see a ventilated prop on a four-stroke application. It, it really has to do with the weight of the boat, um, the horsepower of the engine, uh, the, the model of the engine, uh, the mapping in the ECU, things like that. So moving on from ventilation, we'll go to our last bit of characteristics that we have for us today. Um, this is going to be kind of piggybacking right off of the ventilation. We talk about slip. So slip is the amount of wasted energy that a prop generates. In other words, the actual distance traveled in one full propeller revolution is less than its pitch measurement. So my prop that I discussed earlier with a 17 inch pitch may not truly move 17 full inches in the water. There's always going to be a little bit of slip. Um, there's always positive slip. There is never any negative slip, but all props are engineered with a cert certain amount of slip, whether that be more slip because we are putting it on that two-stroke application and we need the power band to get up high so quicker so we can start moving that boat a whole lot quicker, get on plane, um, reach our top speed, faster hole shots, or you may see... Um, vessels, bigger boats that are going to generate less slip because they need that propeller to bite in the water. Uh, they're making that torque at a lower RPM uh, more so than a, than a higher RPM like a two-stroke. A four-stroke engine is going to produce more torque in the low range. So typically these props are going to be engineered with less slip because we don't need to get to that power band. We have the power right off the bat. We are going to start pushing the boat to get it up and out of the water. Slip leads me to cavitation. Um, cavitation is often uh, misinterpreted and linked to ventilation. Ventilation is, of course, we're trying to create the slip, just like we just discussed. Cavitation is we're not trying to, we're, we're not attempting to have cavitation. Uh, when it comes to cavitation, it is the reduction of pressure in the water across the blade surface. This will create bubbles. So you have a low pressure area that is now going to start creating bubbles. As this propeller spins, the next revolution of the next blade that comes around that chops through those bubbles, it is going to slip. Now, this is not designed to where it's slipping on purpose to achieve uh, a, a performance goal. This is simply, we are 
spinning out in the water. We are hitting air and we are not getting a good clean bite on our water, so we cannot push this vessel forward. When you run into cavitation and the other blades start hitting this cavitation as the revolution of the propeller, you can also damage the finish of your propeller. Whether it be aluminum or stainless steel, you can, you can actually damage the finish and deteriorate it to where now it's not a smooth surface, it's a rough pitted or what we like to, uh, the, the term we use is cavitation burn. Um, you start seeing more cavitation burn on the prop, all it's gonna do is create more cavitation, which is going to create more slip that we do not want. Next thing we're gonna move towards is blade count. Uh, this is also, I would say, uh, probably the third most popular question after pitch and diameter is going to be, how many blades should I have? Um, I, I see propellers over here that have three blades and I see some propellers over here that have four blades. What What is the difference? What what's you know what what benefits me from going from a four to a three or a three blade to a four blade so we'll we'll begin with discussing the three blade propeller um these are going to be the most efficient ones um they are going to be the ones that you do see most often the availability of these props is going to be a whole lot higher than four blade propellers you're going to have better overall all around performance um, and also a better top speed because, again, we have less surface area in the water, which ultimately less surface area, less drag, okay? So we have more efficient, we have better top speeds, we have a, a better availability, and also we have a lower cost. Um, it's easier to come by these three-blade props, and they are a little bit cheaper. Then we'll move towards the four blade. What what does the four blade do for me that the three blade does not do for me? Um, four blade, more surface area in the water, we're going to push more water. So we could end up having a better hole shot depending on our application. We could also run into having better lift, whether it be on the bow or the stern of the of the boat. At the same time, if we have a better hole shot and better lift, that's going to equal better planing. So these, these heavier boats that are loaded down with a bunch of fishing gear, uh, scuba gear, uh, these boats are gonna be able to get up and out of the water quicker and easier to get on plane and reach our cruising speed. Again, heavier boats, uh, more surface area, we're not really concerned about that high top speed. Uh, so we're gonna see a, a, a lower top speed with the four blade prop. Um, but it depends on what your application is. You know, what what are you trying to do? Um, are you trying to go out in, in high seas or are you the guy that just runs around the, the small little lake and, you know, you're just out there having fun all around performance? Um, you know, it, it, it really depends on what you're actually trying to do. So, one of the things that really isn't discussed when we talk about propping is um, where you are. What what location are you in? What region are you in? What what where do you do most of your boating? Or do you have a vacation home um, down south where you're at a lower elevation and you come down here part time and then you come or you go back up north to a higher elevation? You are going to witness performance differences. Um, so altitude is going to greatly affect engine performance, but with the right propeller, you can definitely even out that disadvantage that comes with the change in altitude. So uh, if you guys have ever been to a, a region with a higher elevation, you may have noticed that the air is a whole lot more thin. It's, it's more difficult to breathe. When you lose your breath, it takes a little bit longer to get your breath back. Uh, a higher elevation is going to equal less dense air. And unfortunately, less dense air is going to equal less horsepower. Um, any, most any internal combustion engine is going to suffer 
on the performance side of making power the higher the elevation that the boat is operated in. Um, so you'll see this chart right here that we have uh, we've come up with, and it's simple talking about altitude and then the deduction of the inches of pitch on that propeller. So if you're anywhere below 2,500 feet, if you're going from sea level up to 2,500 feet, you don't need to necessarily worry about dropping down in pitch. Um, you will notice a little bit of performance uh, the difference but not enough to start changing props. Um, once you get up above 2,500 feet to 3,500 feet, that's when we wanna start going down in pitch. That, that motor is not being able to make as much power and generate all the power to the prop, so we need to make it easier for that prop to push that water, which means lowering the pitch on that propeller. Once we get to 3,500 to 4,500 feet, it's it's nice to go down two inches of pitch. Then once we get to 4,500 to 5,500 feet, you may want to think about going down up to three inches in pitch. Once we get above 5,500 feet, it's smart to go down at least four inches, and you may be toying with different props at that point if you're still not satisfied with the performance, and you're still trying to get just a little bit more out of that out of that prop and out of that boat. Um, so you'll see at the bottom, over 2,500 feet, uh, deduct one inch for every 1,000 additional feet. And always remember, um, the 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 heavier the boat, the higher the altitude. That's going to be less pitch. We need to go down in inches of pitch on that propeller. Uh, the lighter the boat and the lower the altitude, we can pick that pitch back up because that motor is now going to be able to produce more power, which is going to give that propeller more thrust and more push. So leading, uh, following altitude, we got temperature. Temperature will also affect engine performance. Um, if you are a tournament fisherman, um, you may travel across the country. You are going to deal with those differences in elevation along with temperature. So always beware that it might be smart if I am uh, the traveling type that I am going to be going in different elevations or drastic changes of temperature. Maybe I should think about having two different props, having a spare prop. So similar to altitude, a rise in temperature, it's going to lower the air density. Um, on a hot summer day, really, really humid day, it, it, it can also it can also be hard to breathe. Um, the outboard it, it feels the same way. If you've ever noticed boating in the winter versus boating in the dead of summer, especially in a low elevation down south, you will run into last winter. I feel like my boat performed a little bit better than it is in the summertime. A common misconception is the owner of the boat wants to bring it into the dealership. He wants to have a tune-up or a service done, figuring out why his boat is not performing the way that it was six months ago. You have to take into that temperature and that elevation. So the colder the temperature, the denser the air. The denser the air, more horsepower is created from that motor. The motor likes dense, cold air. It can produce more power, which means that we can get more push out of that propeller. So you'll see here on our little, uh, our, our temperatures right down at the bottom, these little thermostats, air density increases as temperature drops. So be aware if you are going from a high elevation to a low elevation, or if you are going from a hot temperature to a low temperature, you may witness some different uh, different performance um, results that you are not trying to achieve. Okay, so always remember um, going up in elevation is going to lower our horsepower. Going down in elevation is going to be able to allow that motor to breathe better, which is going to gain in horsepower. And then when we talk about temperature, the colder the temperature more horsepower, the warmer the temperature, 
less horsepower. So now we'll move on to propeller materials, uh, stainless or aluminum, which one's better for me? Well, the first question that I would have is, what do you do? Um, what, where do you boat? Are you in offshore waters or are you running the rivers in skinny waters up north? When it comes to the different materials of the propellers, <clears throat> the stainless steel is going to be ideal for those open deep waters. Uh, typically, the stainless steel props are also up to five times harder than the aluminum, which means that those blades can be a little bit thinner and they will be stronger. Now, with that being said, if we use a stainless steel propeller in a in an area that has very shallow waters and I'm running the risk of hitting a sandbar or running into a reef, I can ultimately damage some internal parts of my outboard because my propeller is actually that strong and my propeller is not going to give out or a blade might not break off of it. It's simply going to strike an underwater object, um, a, you know, submerged object, and next thing you know, you have an issue going on inside the lower unit or even worse, you could also have an issue all the way up to the top of the motor and, and the power head itself. When it comes to aluminum propellers, uh, these are gonna be more forgiving. So these are gonna be ideal for the shallow waters, um, some debris, debris filled waters, uh, shallow lakes that are full of stumps or skinny rivers that are full of rocks. You run into these rocks, you hit a stump, it's gonna tear up that aluminum propeller. It's probably gonna take a, a blade or two off of it, but it is going to save some of the damage that could be done to your lower unit or your power head itself. Um, these also, they're gonna be a lighter weight. Um, with that being said, you're gonna run into the expense side of it. Uh, aluminum propellers are always going to be less expensive. Stainless steel propellers can be dramatically uh, more, more expensive depending on the, the size of the, the gear case, um, the model of the propeller, things like that. Um, so it, it, it's a give or take. Uh, what, what is your application? Where are you boating? Um, that's gonna be the real answer to uh, what propeller material do I wanna use? Um, there are a lot of people out there that have stainless steel props and they use aluminum propellers as their backup props. When it comes to switching back and forth between aluminum or stainless steel, the aluminum propellers, they are lighter weight, they are not as strong. So depending throughout the RPM range, you could run into the propeller blades twisting the slightest bit. So if I have a 15 inch aluminum propeller, my pitch being 15 inches, during that RPM range, it might actually act more like a 14 inch prop or a 14 and a half. Maybe it doesn't really lose that full inch and that full 200 RPMs. So when I go from aluminum prop to, an, to a stainless steel propeller, what I wanna do is actually drop down in pitch. The propeller blades on the stainless steel prop are gonna be stronger, more rigid, so they are not going to flex or twist as easy. So 15 inch aluminum propeller, I wanna go down to a 14 inch stainless steel propeller. And again, what material do you need? It's all about where you're located and really what you're, what you're trying to accomplish, where you do your boating and how you do your boating. So now that we've talked about our uh, what the propeller is, the, the characteristics of the propeller, the natural things that can change the performance goal and those characteristics and the materials of the propeller, now we can discuss a little bit about repowering. Um, whether it be repowering our old boat with a new outboard or maybe we actually went and bought a entirely new boat. We sold the old one and we are we're ready for a new one, we're moving on up. Um, there's a couple of things that you have to consider when, when propping a new boat or propping a repower. Uh, first things first, um, 
you'll look to our right. Uh, Yamaha does have application engineers that do go to boat manufacturers and test the whether it's a new model of a boat or maybe a new model of an outboard. We, uh, we send application engineers out there with a trailer full of propellers and their job is simply to find the propeller that best suits that boat all around. So each boat is gonna be manufactured um, by a manufacturer with a different performance goal in mind. Um, so first things first is what type of boat do you have? Uh, is it a deep V hole? Is it a bay boat? Is it a bass boat? Um, so you can use these performance bulletins to better guide you in propping that new vessel or that repower. So uh, some things to consider simply are going to be the boat's dimensions. Those are going to be some of the most important things we have are what is the length of your boat? What is the beam or the width of your boat? What is your boat's weight? Um, what possibly is the fuel capacity of the boat? When it's full, it's going to weigh different than a dry weight of an empty boat. Um, the next thing you're going to have to consider is your outboard horsepower. What size motor are you wanting to put on this boat? Or what size motor does this new boat that you have purchased? What motor does it? What motor does it have on it? What what are you what are you purchasing? Um, and then again, how the boat will be used, as well as the environment it'll be in. So right there, we're talking about how, how are we going to use it? Where are we going to be? Are we going to be uh, concerned about top speeds a, or whole shot? Are we going to be at a higher elevation or at a lower elevation? You will notice in the performance bulletins to the right, they go in very, very, uh, very good detail um, about how they're testing these these boats you'll notice that they even discuss the, the the temperature and the elevation along with the wind um we've already talked about our elevation and our temperature how that will change so that is important to reference when you're looking at a perform performance bulletin because this is not the guaranteed setup that you may need. You may be at a higher elevation, which means, oh, well, we see we see here that um, this 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 performance bulletin right here is showing and we are at 970 feet elevation and we're running an 18 inch pitch prop. Well, just like we discussed earlier, if we are at a higher elevation above 2,500 feet, maybe we need to start going down in pitch to really achieve that performance goal that that, that this boat's intended for. Um, so with that being said, uh, we have our performance bulletins. We also have the tools for you to use as a consumer. Um, Yamaha Propeller Selector. So if you go to Yamaha Propeller or PropSelector.com, you'll actually see this little screenshot on the left side of the screen that says, let's get started. Um, this is a, a good tool for people to use. It, I will say that it is better used when you already have a boat. So if you're doing a repower or if you are just looking for different performance goals in your boat right now and you're just looking for a new propeller, there's a there's a couple steps that you need to that you need to follow to find the the proper propeller that is actually recommended for you by us. Um, the first step is simply going to be selecting the boat type. Um, so whether it is a bass boat, a bay boat, a catamaran, a john boat, um, a rib style boat, uh, a, a working boat, whatever it may be, you have to select that. That's going to be our first goal is, okay, let's select our boat type. The second step is going to be selecting our outboard horsepower. So do you have 150 horsepower? Do you have a 200 horsepower? Next, you're going to select the outboard model. So you selected 150 horsepower. Do you have a four stroke F-150 or do you have a four stroke VF-150, our 4.2 liter show motor that's found on bass boats? A uh, little bit more acceleration, a little bit more mapping in the computer. So it's, it's ideal to know what model you have, not only the horsepower, but 
what model of that motor do you have? How does that, how, what's the goal of that engine itself? Our four steps gonna be select outboard application. That's simply going to be the number of engines that you have. So let's say that we selected a 150 horsepower engine and it was the VF150. Most likely we are going to have a single engine application. This will play into the role of picking your propellers because more engines, more weight, more drag in the water, uh, it, 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 all, it all accounts. The next thing we got is number five is going to be selecting performance goals. So again, are we the water skier? Are we the tournament fishermen? Are we the offshore fishermen? Um, do we want, are we the grandparents that are bringing the kids out to the lake and all we're doing is cruising around and tubing? Or are we competition skiing and we need to yank that guy out of the water and get up to a, a, a good cruising speed? Um, it all depends on your performance goal. If we don't know your performance goal, we don't know which way to direct you. Next, we have entering the current pitch of your propeller and your current wide open throttle RPMs. This is, this is why I say this can be easier if you already have a, a boat and you know what your current pitch of propeller is and what your current wide open throttle RPM is. It's going to ask you, what pitch propeller do you have? Well, let's say I select 20 inches of pitch. Then it's going to ask me, what is your current wide open throttle? I'm going to select 5,000 RPMs. Right there, that tells us, okay, we need to go down in pitch because our operating range of these engines that we want to see at wide open throttle is going to be 5,500 to 6,000 RPMs. And just like we discussed pitch earlier, each inch of pitch can give us a change of anywhere from 100 to 200 RPMs. So maybe we need to go down more than a couple inches in pitch to get this boat operating up at that closer to 6,000 RPM range. Last but not least, you are going to be given a list of recommendations. Um, now, these are not going to be uh, very uh, detailed or guaranteed, they're going to give you a list of here are your options, okay? We saw that you were at 5,000 RPMs and you're running a 20 inch pitch prop. So we would recommend that maybe you go down to a 16 inch pitch and we can pick up those RPMs to get closer between that 5,500 and 6,000 RPM range. It's gonna give you a list of all the propellers that are that that will fit that gear case size along with this is what we think you should be changing we think you need to go down to a 16 inch pitch as opposed to that 20 inch pitch so we can hopefully gain 800 rpms and get you closer to that 6000 rpms so again you'll see the website at the bottom here yamahapropselector.com uh we've we've worked diligently to try to do it for you we just need a little bit of your assistance it's not simply what boat what prop is supposed to go on this motor and what prop is supposed to go on this boat we need a little bit of information from the consumer um, themselves to figure out how to how do we get you to achieve your performance goals and how do we keep selling you guys fun that's that's the whole purpose of all this in, in boating is we want to we all want to enjoy the water we all want to be out there spend time with our families and we want you to be satisfied and, and enjoy that every single time you get out to that boat. With that being said, propeller maintenance, uh, it, it plays a, a huge, huge role into the performance of your outboard and to keeping the performance where it should be on your outboard. So besides just looking at the propeller, um, you know, there are just a little few, few little tasks that you can do that simply will keep a better eye on your propeller. Um, you might notice things that are going on. Um, simple, you know, uh, making sure that my propeller is fastened. So right here, you'll see on the far left, we have occasional removal of our propeller to check for fishing line or propeller shaft seal damage. 
more times than not, any any body of water that you're in, I'm sure there's a couple fishing lines floating around. Whether it be you accidentally just brought the fishing line close to the propeller and it just completely spool, spool, spooled your reel, or did you simply just run through somebody's fishing line and now it's all tangled up in that in that propeller? Um, it's key to pull that off. If you do see anything like that, it's best to take it to your dealership, have them pressure test it, make sure you haven't lost any uh, lower unit gear oil. Next thing you wanna do is you always wanna make sure that that propeller shaft is greased um, when installing that, impeller, that propeller back on there. More times than not, if you're in saltwater environment and you do not keep these propeller shafts greased, they will seize up onto the propeller shaft. Um, the prop will seize up on the propeller shaft and be very, very difficult for you to remove during services or even removing when you're trying to change to a different prop or replace your prop, whatever it may be. Um, then we move on to checking propeller nut torque. Um, if these propellers are not seated fully onto our propeller shafts, they are not going to do their job. They are not going to be centered on the propeller shaft. They'll be able to move forward and backwards. We want that propeller in one location and one position to where it can push the boat forward or it can move the boat backwards. We do not want any slack in the propeller. Uh, slack, all that's going to give us is vibrations, noise, and possibly lead to, to damage to our lower unit um, or the propeller itself. After we torque our propeller nut down, we want to make sure that we are installing cotter pins. Um, the, the proper installation of the cotter pin is key. Um, <clears throat> if we do not have this cotter pin in here, just like you see on the picture on the right, harmonics from the motor running in the water can ultimately loosen that castellated nut and cause that nut to back off and fall off. Typically, if you're in forward gear and that castellated nut falls off, well, that prop is driving into that that lower unit, so it's not going to fall off. But as soon as you go into neutral, it's going to vibrate, it's going to spin a little bit, and it's going to fall right off the back. Next thing you know, you're going back into gear, and we have no forward thrust because we have no propeller anymore. So we want to make sure that after we're torquing our propellers that we are installing cotter pins. Uh, one key thing about the installation of a cotter pin is if you're pulling a cotter pin out, throw that one away in the trash and insert a new cotter pin, especially uh, in waters that deal with you know, salt water, a lot of corrosion, things like that. You don't want to put a damaged or corroded cotter pin in there and run the risk of it actually falling out and ultimately loosen that propeller. So after propeller maintenance, uh, you know, that's really all that I have. So with the right propeller and proper maintenance of that propeller, you can discover a new level of performance. Maybe you purchased a boat used and you've never been satisfied with the performance of that boat. And really it comes down to you have way too big of a diameter or way too big of uh, or way too high of a pitch. And the motor simply cannot get out of its own way and give you the forward thrust that you want. Or maybe it's simply you have way too small of a propeller, you have way too small a diameter, you have way too small or low of pitch, and that prop is just spinning in the water. So we have really, really high RPMs, but we have no forward movement. We don't have that top speed that we're looking for. So that's all that I have for you guys today. Um, thank you for letting me be a part of the, the ABYC seminars, and I will let David take over for some questions and answers. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. That was great. I think uh, everyone out there learned something. Uh, we do have some questions here, and it looks like we do have a few minutes to uh, go over a few here. So let's start at the top. Um, can you explain the main difference between pitch and rake? So pitch, so pitch is going to be the twist, okay? So yeah, I wish I had a propeller here to show you, but um, the pitch is going to be the actual twist of the blade. So how easy does it slice and cut right through the water? Um, rake is going to be how far back or forward the blade is actually leaned back onto that barrel. So if we have a propeller that has no pitch, so I have no twist right here in my hand, and I also have no rake, that propeller is simply going to be able to spin in that water very easily. It might even simply just free spin to where 
we simply do not have any forward movement. Um, then we have an issue where we have more pitch. So we have more twist of this blade right here, and we have a pretty good bit of rake coming back here. This propeller is going to bite in the water and is going to move that boat forward more so than a prop with less pitch and less rake. So more pitch, more rake, more aggressive propeller, more movement forward if our outboard allows for it. First things first, we got to have that power to be able to push or turn that propeller. Right. Uh, what does cavitation burn look like? Cavitation burn. So you may have seen it before on some stainless steel props, even aluminum props. Um, what you will start to notice is on the front edges right here, what you're going to see is the finish is simply going to go away. It's honestly, it's going to look more like somebody got some sandpaper grit or a sand blaster. And the, the, the leading edges of that propeller blade are going to be what, what I would call pitted. Um, or looks like a sandblaster just hit hit them. And what that's going to cause is not smooth, right? We want to have that smooth so we cut through the water nice and easy. If we don't have that smooth, we're going to create low pressure areas behind whatever pitting, um, chunks missing out of the propeller, propeller damage. All that's going to do is allow for that propeller to slip in the water. Once it does that, the next blade that comes around is going to hit that air and it's going to be, it's going to create friction. It's going to be so hot that it literally will burn the tips of your propeller, ultimately pretty much disintegrating the finish of the propeller, which is simply just going to cause more and more and more cavitation. So if you notice your propeller, the leading edges of the blades seem to be very dull or rough. Um, I would advise you guys to go to a local dealer or a propeller shop, have them take a look at it, see if they can um, help bring back some of that finish. But more times than not, once we run into too much cavitation burn, it'll actually start taking little chunks and things out of the tips of the propeller, which there's really no coming back from that. All it's going to do is cause more and more problems, more and more slip, cavitation which means lack of performance and forward thrust right looks like we got time for one more question here uh how do uh sorry thing popped up there uh how do dual props work without oh, cavitation oh, you got me can you hear me Can you hear me, David? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. All right. Uh, the final question for you, how do dual props work without cavitation? Dual props. So we, uh, we, don't, we, you know, we didn't really touch on dual props. Um, when it comes to Yamaha, we only have one, um, one, propel, one lower unit. Uh, it would be our TRP gear case. And how they actually run is they run uh, opposite of each other. So one will spin one way and the other will spin, uh, will, will simply spin um, the opposite way. Um, you're really focusing on the bite of that forward propeller to move that boat through the water. Um, you are going to have a little bit of cavitation. Um, typically when you deal with a dual, a dual prop uh, lower unit, you will actually see different pitches. Um, so one's going to have a harder time biting through the water while the other one is going to have a little bit less of a hard time free spinning in that water. All right, and that's bringing us right up against the, uh, the clock here. So thanks again to Tyler, really appreciate the presentation here. Thank you Yamaha for that. Uh, you know, we know you're taking time out of your day to, to help educate our members and uh, the boating world out there. Uh, so once again, I wanna thank our sponsors, uh, Safe Harbor, Xylem Rule, Jabsco, Betis Maxwell and the Society of Accredited Marine Surveyors. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, the link should pop up right around now to apply for CEUs. Uh, and we will see you all November 19th. Thanks again, Tyler. Thank you, David. Thanks, everybody.